Welcome to the Mentor Podcast, where the most highly motivated entrepreneurs come to get their weekly dose of financial stability with host Ron LeGrand, as well as other nationally recognized thought leaders who will teach you how to get, grow, and protect your wealth. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another issue of the Mentor Podcast. This is Ron LeGrand, and I have Tim Bratz on the phone here today, and he's got a very interesting uh, a subject to discuss. In fact, if you want to make it, they need the real big money in real estate because literally this guy has come from nothing to uh, well over 2,500 uh, doors today in apartments, and I'm going to let him tell you his story, but you will be impressed, and especially at how little bit of time from the time he started till now that he's created this empire. Hi, Tim. Ron, excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I think the first thing we ought to do is tell him who you are and um, what you have accomplished, which is nothing short of amazing, and give them, so then they'll have an idea who they're talk, uh, listening to here. So maybe we'll get them to listen <laughs> oh, man. for more than three or four minutes before they fall asleep on us. All right. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Well, I, again, I, I appreciate you having me here. I appreciate all the content and all the value you've provided over the years and uh, really excited to be on the, on the podcast. So um, high level on me, I'm, I'm a, a normal guy from a blue collar town outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and uh, when I was going through school and going through college, the, the market was going gangbusters. So this is a, you know, 03 to 07. And uh, when I graduated, um, people asked me what I wanted to do. I said, I want to make money. So I got involved in real estate, right? Because everybody's making money back then. Yeah. And uh, I moved out to New York City at the time. Um, my brother was living out there. I got a job as a commercial real estate agent, uh, brokering retail space, office space, things like that. And I remember the first deal that I brokered. Um, it was about 400 square feet. So not, not very big size of a couple <laughs> bedrooms, you know, and, um, we signed a lease with a tenant for $10,000 per month with a 4% annual increase and a 12 year lease term. Yeah. So, <laughs> Only in New York. So, huh? <laughs> hey, hey, I'm doing the math on this thing, Ron. I'm like, yeah. I, I'm on the wrong side of the coin. I need to be owning real estate. Like think about this guy's making almost $2 million over the next 12 years for doing something at one point in time. So yeah. the idea of residual income and passive income, um, and that mailbox money really got me excited and uh, decided that I wanted to become an investor. So spent a lot of time, you know, going through that analysis paralysis phase and trying to learn everything before I did anything. And uh, eventually realized in order for me to learn how to swim, I got to jump in the water. And so I uh, moved down to Charleston, South Carolina, a little bit north of where you're at. Um, and uh, this is 09 now, I bought my first house. So the market already crashed. Uh, it was, it was, uh, everything run from real estate. I've never done a deal before. Didn't have any money. Um, uh, but I was pretty resourceful, right? A lot of people say, Hey, I can't get involved in real estate because I don't have the time and all the money. I don't have the resources. Um, uh, but I heard Tony Robbins say once that, you know, resourcefulness is the ultimate resource. And I, I, uh, believe that in a big way. And so if you're resourceful, you will find the money, you'll find the time, you'll find the knowledge. And, um, I called up my credit card company, asked them to increase my credit limit. On my credit card, they give me a, a limit of $15,000, and I found the cheapest house on the MLS, bought it on my credit card, did all the work to it, <laughs> flipped it in 70 days, and made about thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars 14000 So, well, boy, um, that, that sounds familiar, Tim. <laughs> I can't tell you how many houses I bought on credit cards way back. Mm -hmm. So, it was one of those things where, uh, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm a punk 23-year-old kid, and... Uh, it's the worst housing market in 80 years, and uh, somehow I just made money doing this. So did it again, did it again. You get involved in uh, different transactions. I got involved in wholesaling. I really liked that. And then eventually I met people who had money, but maybe did not have the uh, the time or mm -hmm. the bandwidth or, or the education on how to invest in real estate. So we decided to start partnering up. They would bring the money. I'd do the work. We'd carve up the deal uh, however we saw fit. And um, it got me to start you know, holding a few properties, and then I'd refinance them out. And then I got into the turnkey space, started a management company, just kind of compounded. You know, I knew real estate would work. I just didn't know what the avenue that I wanted to focus on was. And eventually I bought an apartment building about almost seven years ago and uh, just really liked the scalability of it. It was easier to finance. It was easier to, um, uh, to operate. I can go and do due diligence on, on one building, you know, that's, that's, 20 units versus going around to 20 different houses and checking mm -hmm. out 20 roofs, you know, and looking at one roof versus, you know, so it was just, there was more scale to it. I could negotiate with one seller versus 20 sellers and uh, things like that. So it met my long, met my long-term goals. I know a lot of people make money in different capacities in real estate and sure. um, I love them all. It's just for me and what I, what my ambitions were, 
um, apartment buildings just seemed to be it. So kind of got rid of everything else and drew a line in the sand. And hold hold on a minute. Stop. Take a breath. Take a breath before you faint on me now. (laughs) So your first apartment building was in 2009 and that was 20 units, right? Yeah. So my first, that was my first investment property was in 2009. So that was a little duplex um, in, in in a tough, tough neighborhood. I bought yeah. my first apartment building. It was an eight unit in uh, 2012. And 2012. So, um, All right. So yeah. I'm, talking, I, yeah. I'm, 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 I want our, our listeners to hear the time frame, the short time frame here that's gone by sure. since where you were and where you are right now. So then you bought eight units in 2012. Then you bought well, 20 units. Yeah, I, I bought, well, I bought, I bought eight units and then I bought another eight unit. And I, there were a couple of guys that I kind of par- partnered up with and I was mm-hmm. essentially married to these guys. I wasn't doing any other business other than what I was doing with them. We built up a portfolio of around, I don't know, about 150 units. And then, you know, just life happens, partnerships fall apart, expectations yeah, are different do. in people's minds, right? Mm-hmm. And so that partnership ended up going south and we ended up liquidating everything in 2015, 2016. So I had, you know, I, I, I was, I've been in real estate for uh, over a decade um, was, was kind of trying to figure it out and get my feet together, um, or gain my footing in the first five, six, seven years and got pretty good at it the past three, four years. And so, um, when, when I liquidated all those properties with those guys, uh, I had enough knowledge. Uh, my biggest building at that time was probably 30 unit. And I said, Hey, you know, my, I, I, I don't have the weight on my shoulders anymore. I can spread my wings. Let me go and, uh, see if I can get into something bigger. So I bought 84 units. Um, as soon as I, I, uh, got out of that partnership. So that was in 20, at the end of 2015, about 84 units. Um, at the end of 2016, I bought another 194 units, uh, 2017, I think I only bought about 80 units, maybe, maybe a couple more than that. I probably bought about a hundred units in 2017. Um, so I, I'm at about five, 600 units at that time. Um, and then in early 2018, I just kind of, you know, the momentum really caught right the yeah. uh the snowball effect really set in mm-hmm. and at that time i picked up um almost, almost about 800 900 units in 20, 2018 wow yeah and then okay. and then this year so far i picked up another 1000 um and wow. i have another 600 closing and, in 2 weeks and this year in the middle of 2019 you picked up another 1000 already All yeah right, so i'll, I'll be at around 4000 units by the end of the year no kidding, man. That is nothing short of amazing. All right. Well, our listeners, however, are sitting there thinking to themselves, well, oh, that works for him, but I don't know how it's going to work for me. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't have a big financial statement, and I don't know that I can go borrow all that money. And, and I don't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to put up for down payments and that sort of thing. So let's get to the meat here, sir. Tell me how you went about amassing the capital to get all of these Wait. units, and how do you buy them today? Great question. So uh, there's a lot of people overcomplicate commercial real estate. I don't think it needs to be as complicated as we build up in our heads. It's just some different lingo, some different verbiage. Um, it's actually easier to do bigger deals than it is to do yep. smaller deals. I, uh, stop. Because the I, I stop now. I know, of course, you say that and I know that and you know that, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm listening to this and I haven't bought any bigger deals yet. You know, I'm only about half buying it, <clears throat> but it is true because money's chasing deals and the more mm-hmm. money you can uh, use of theirs, the, the more interested they are in your deal. So it's really that simple, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And, and all I've done is I've taken my, my residential business model and I've duplicated it in apartments. So just like most people have to go in, buy a house and fix it up and flip it, and they have to be all in for 65% of that stabilized value, I do the same thing. The only difference is there's a few more zeros, right? So I'm, I'm buying and I'm all into an apartment building that's worth $10 million for about $6.5 million. And that's usually because I have to force appreciation, right? I have to put in the sweat equity and do right, the value minute. add so type stuff. You're buying apartments then that need turned around, uh, mm-hmm. rehabbed usually, and or, and rented. And that's what you call stabilized when you get them to that point. Correct. So you're buying them down, just like we buy ugly mm-hmm. houses, and you're creating mm-hmm. your own value, okay? Yep, exactly. So how do you get a 200-unit apartment complex financed? Uh, you're buying it at 65% of the value. That's great. That's not all that hard. Uh, how are you going to get the money to make this happen? Because that's what, that's what we want to hear. Great, great question. So the financing, usually, like, so I go get financing for 80% of the purchase and, and uh, renovation costs. So, so 80% okay. of the total cost comes Slow from the bank. Or, Slow down. Go ahead. Slow down. So um, you're going to get financing for the 65% of the purchase price and let's say another 
I don't know, 15% above that uh, to uh, purchase, the pro I mean, rehab the property and some holding costs along the way because you won't have any cash flow while you're doing all of this or probably not enough. So you borrow enough money to cover the interim cash flow and everything else you need and then some. Is that correct? Correct. But some still buildings well that I buy the, are... Yeah, well below the stabilized value. Correct. So right. uh, that's just part of the cost, you know, the part like the interest reserve and whatever the debt service is going to cost is, mm -hmm. is, is, is added into the cost of the total deal. So you got roofs, you got fixtures, you got flooring and you got debt service, you know, so right. you can calculate that in. <clears throat> so, and then, uh, and then what I do is I go and raise private money for the 20% yeah. down, which everybody expects you to do in commercial real estate. All right. So you arrive at a number based on your due diligence and your research before you close. You got a number, now you know what the number is you're borrowing against, which is still, uh, in your case, no more than 80% of the after repaired value as we use in the house business. And uh, that's even plugging in a vacancy factor of what? You're not, that doesn't mean it has to be 100% occupied. What percent are you using, 90%? Yeah, usually usually okay. somewhere between 90 to 94% occupancy. Yes, and you have to add a reserve in there. The lenders won't even give you the money, which which is on what, two, 3% or so in your case? Yeah, yeah, usually right. it's, um, okay. You're talking about a capital expense reserve? Okay. So the goal is yep. to buy the properties so that a loan of 80% of the stabilized value is enough to cover all of that. So you have plenty of money to get the job done. Now the problem is the lender won't loan you 80% of the stabilized value. Uh, I'm sorry, 80% of, yeah, of stable. Uh, they'll only loan you 80%. So you have to come up, but they won't loan you 80% without you putting skin in the game. So they want you to put 20% down and then they'll loan you the rest. Am I on target? Yeah, so let, let's, okay. let's, so you, let's you're, put an let example of some statement. numbers together. All right, let's do it. Yeah, let's, so let's say I have a, a building that's going to be worth $10 million. Mm -hmm. It's very predictable what the building is going to be worth correct. because it's based on the income approach. So it, that's it, correct. all they care about is how much money is the property uh, uh, mm -hmm. receiving in gross income, what are all the expenses, and then what's the net income? It's always a multiple of that, and that'll differentiate depending on which community or city that you're buying it of, uh, of what that property right. will appraise for. And the, the cap rate, yeah. right? Right. Right. Okay. So, so on, on an example of that, if, if the building's going to be worth $10 million, I need to be all into it for 6.5. Then let's say it needs a couple hundred thousand or, or a million dollars worth of work, and there's holding costs and some other stuff you know, all in, you know, I'm, I'm buying it for four, four and a half million bucks and I'm, I'm, I'm then putting some work in. Okay. So that's just the cost of the project, 6.5 million. Now, how do I get the money? The bank will give me 80% of the cost. So they'll give me a, a little over $5 million for a, for a building that I'm all into for $6.5 million. Then okay. I go and raise about 1.5 million bucks from mm -hmm private lenders. And it is assumed and it is totally uh, uh, okay. And, um, uh, you know, it, people actually promote it to go and raise money from private lenders. Yeah. You don't have to use any of your own money in these deals. I the use all okay private lenders money. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Are, in fact, it, that's it is quite a normal. standard yeah. operating procedure in, yeah. in commercial real estate. That's called equity capital. And the bank mm -hmm. is putting up the debt capital. Now, Correct. Now, what, what about who goes and applies for this big loan? So that was one of the things that I didn't realize. So now mm -hmm. I get the loans, right? Because I have a balance sheet. I didn't realize that there were people called sponsors out there who would co-sign and, and get the loan. So essentially you need somebody who has a net worth equal to the loan amount and liquidity equal to 10% of the loan amount. That's about what the terms are today in today's lending environment. So on a $6.5 million um, uh, all in deal that the loan amount is around 5 million bucks, right? About around 80%. That okay. means you have to have somebody who has a net worth equal to $5 million mm -hmm. and about 500,000 liquid, 10% of that. Right. And, um, and so, you know, so now I, no I sponsor money. all my own deals. But they don't put any right? money in the so, deal. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but no, yeah, they don't if, have to. But if they do, then now they're one of these equity investors as well. Exactly. Right. right. So they, they get a piece for putting in the uh, signing another piece for investing, correct? Exactly. Correct. Can, can you tell us uh, what these people get for signing on the note? Yeah. So it, there's different there's different types of uh, syndications out there. There's some where the, the money, the, the equity investors get 70, 80, 85 percent of the deal and, and the operators only get 10 or 15 or 20 percent of the deal. 
Um, I think I, I don't think that's congruent with with how much work needs to go into these things, especially in today's market Great, where money's easy <laughs> and deals are hard, right? Agreed. So, but then there's the then there's the opposite side of the spectrum when, um, like, I know some guys who just borrow debt um, and then they pay their investors a fixed, you know, ten percent or twelve percent on their money, and then when they refinance or when they sell, they they cash out that investor that and the investor doesn't get any equity in the deal. It's kind of written up where they're an equity investor, but as soon as they get a certain return, they're cashed out and they don't keep any equity uh, long-term. I'm kind of a hybrid of those two different models. So what I do is we pay a fixed return to our investors while the money's in play. Usually it takes me about 12 to 18 months to stabilize and refinance. Mm -hmm. I don't sell anything. I hold these for long-term legacy right. wealth building. All right, we're coming back and to that so, in a minute. Let me get this first one mm -hmm. answered first. How does your co-signer or how does your signer get paid? A percent? So uh, Yeah, so they get a percentage or, of the deal. And in my deals, it's usually around 20% of the deal. Okay. And your equity investors uh, get a rate of return. Do, do they own any part of the deal? Correct. So they'll get, they'll get a fixed return of about 10% while the money's in play. Then when we refinance, they get all their money back and they keep about 20% equity in the deal forever. So now they have 20% okay. of any refinance proceeds, 20% of any cash flow, 20% of any future sales proceeds. Well, I don't imagine you don't have trouble getting investors with that generous offer. Nope. Nope. We, we, raised offer, seven, me. Yeah. We, we, we raised $7 million for deals closing this month in the that past three weeks. Is, yeah, okay. But you got a little track record, so let's be fair. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking like sure. this is my first one. All right. In fact, if, if, what would you suggest that people do if it is their first one? I find somebody locally or somebody, or even nationally, like a sponsor can be anywhere. And then I would go to your private money lenders that are already lending you money on residential flips or, uh, or anybody that you're already doing business with and, and show them a little bit different model. You know what I've noticed is that the same way that a lot of uh, real estate investors, active operators like us, they go yeah. through this transitional phase and this yep. progression in their lifespan, right? So they start out yep. brokering like I did, then they get into wholesaling, then they get into flipping, then they get into like, turnkey or maybe some small single family rentals and then small multi and then get into the, like the larger multi and they go through this this progression i found that that hard money lenders do the same thing they're tired yeah. of the transactional stuff they want to build long-term wealth Absolutely. so instead of making 15 percent on their money they're willing to take 10 percent because now you're giving them some equity in the deal that they can yeah. really build up some wealth with and okay. uh and it works really really well i raise a lot of money from, from i'm hard gonna take two cents in here first mm -hmm. of all you shouldn't even be looking at these kind of projects unless you're trained on what the heck you're even looking for because you 100%. have to know how to put a deal together or you're just going to, uh, frankly, just kill perfectly good lenders and so forth that you'll work with by bringing them crap deals that anybody could see in a moment's notice that that's trained. Mm -hmm. So it starts with what is a deal, how to put that together so you can present it, and then if I were them, I would latch on to somebody that's already doing this and be somehow be part of that, maybe be the person looking for the deals for them or whatever, to get the mm -hmm. experience to go through this process, which you know doesn't take that long to get through, maybe a year or two, but mm -hmm. by the time you come out, now you have the tools in your head to get the job done right. Because if you present crap, you're, you're just gonna alienate a bunch of folks that could make you very, very wealthy. Uh, mm -hmm. and speaking to that, um, you have promised to do a three hour simulcast for us coming up here sometime in the not too distant future. So. Guys, um, be on the lookout for the simulcast with Tim, and this is what it's going to be all about. It's three hours, and it's, it's real time. You know, it's he, him sitting in a room with me sitting beside him, prodding him, and literally going digging deep into this stuff because we talk about a lot of stuff that's got to be explained, like, you know, how do you determine mm -hmm. the value of that property going forward, and how do you determine what you can borrow after you get it stabilized and that kind of stuff. So um, make note. Uh, look for Tim's email from us. We'll get him in there as soon as we can, probably in the next couple of months. Uh, secondly, Love it. you are um, actually committed to come to my commercial boot camp at the end of this year, aren't you? We're doing it. Oh, I'll yeah. be there. All right. You and I will talk about that later, but i got to give you some time on this subject. And um, I think it's, um, what is it, October the 21st, I think you'll be there. So anyway, guys, look for that. I'm doing, I do a commercial boot camp. Uh, he, uh, Tim is a specialist. I'm a generalist. I like to do all kinds of commercial stuff. So I'm going to let him have the apartment business portion of that. And, uh, we're going to dig deep in that while we're there. Plus you're going to speak at our summit next year, aren't you, sir? 
Uh, I'll so be there, buddy. Probably, yeah. Okay. So I kind of stumbled onto Tim by accident, but now that I got him, we're going to utilize the crap out of him and pick his brain. <laughs> so he's in it. Okay. So Tim, all right. Now we got this thing bought. Now the whole end game here, and actually your exit strategies are only two: either sell it or refinance it and keep it. Right. Mm-hmm. Correct. And you yep. don't want to kill the golden geese. So nope. you get it stabilized. You get the math as good as you're going to get it. You get the net operating income up as high as you can get it. And mm-hmm. then you go to refinance it. And what what loan to value ratio can you get on the then current value? Yep. Great question. The reason I'm all in for 65% of the loan to value is because mm-hmm. typically my, my loans, when I refinance it, go between 70 to 80% loan to value. So on this example that we've been talking about, let's say I'm all in for 6.5 million and it's worth 10, the, the, the bank, which is actually an agency loan is who I get. So I get non-recourse debt through a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac um, type of a lender. Oh, and, uh, what does non-recourse yep. mean, Tim? It means you're not personally guaranteeing the loan. Wow. Uh, now there's some bad boy carve outs. Nobody guarantees yeah. the loan. Nope. How can Nobody that be, guarantees Tim? the loan. How can that be? It's because it's based on the property oh. itself. The only recourse against the loan is taking the property back. Now, if you lie, cheat, or steal, then yeah, they can come after you personally. Um, but as long as it's outside of your hands of um, right. of why the loan went bad, you know, right. let's say the, a major economic player in the town moved out and mm-hmm. occupancy dropped, you can't cover the loan, the bank will take back that property and, um, and they're not coming after you personally. So it's you a, yeah, as really? you increase your net income and your net worth, you're trying to decrease your, your ongoing liabilities and your risks, and, yeah. and that's one way to do it. And, so and Let me make um, a point here, can I? When you go mm-hmm. after that loan, now it's you that's going after the loan. You have no more partners in the deal. Mm-hmm. Have, well, except the equity partners that are hanging around that still have a piece in it. But you do have um, a loan that you're pulling cash out of, because that is one of the points. You're paying off all the debt. You're paying off everybody that's getting out of the deal. And it's non-recourse, which means it will never show on your credit report. It'll never show mm-hmm. on your financial statement because it is not your loan. They're making the money to the LLC, and you're not liable for it. And guys, I want you to think about that for a minute. No matter what happens, they're not coming after you to collect that debt. They're going to get the apartment complex if something were to go haywire like it did in many places in 2008. So, Tim, mm-hmm. are you looking at a probably, I don't know, a year and a half, two years before you go up there refinance? Yeah. It, on average, we're, we're probably right around 15 to 18 months. And mm-hmm. so at that time, we'll go and get a new loan at 75% loan to value. So they'll give us $7.5 million. With that, we pay off the $5 million acquisition loan. We pay back mm-hmm. the $1.5 million in private money we borrowed. And then there's still a million dollars of refinance proceeds, which are non-taxable. And then right. we carve those up amongst all the owners, including the, the equity investors. And, uh, and then we hang, hang on to this thing for the next 10 years. And uh, because we have usually a 10 year loan term in place, what I don't want is five years from now, the loan to come due. And right. uh, you know, we didn't pay down enough principal on it. It hasn't appreciated too enough. Yeah. We're at the peak right now. We all know that what happens with the economic uncertainty and political uncertainty and all those things. So I want at least 10 years. The reason because of that is because if you look at 2006, you bought in the peak of the last cycle, even going through the Great Recession by 2016, you were able to pay down enough principal and the property was appreciate was able to appreciate enough where you still had options at that time mm-hmm. when the loan comes due. So that's, yeah. that's why we do it at least a 10 to 12 year loan term. And then, uh, and then, and then we hang on to it, man. Yeah. You haven't gone after the 221 HUD loans? No, no, I have not. Mm-hmm. Th- those are th- those are the new construction, the 40 year ones, right? Oh, no, they got new construction. They got refinance and they got build. And they, they go up yeah. to 93% so, of the value. Yeah. So and on a lot of those, no there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of, a lot of, mm-hmm. I, I have HUD properties that are subsidized through HUD. Um, mm-hmm. I have one actually, but it's a lot of work and uh, we like to no, move a little bit, a little bit faster. No, so. sir. It's a lot of work for somebody, not you. <laughs> you <laughs> right. hire a consultant and let them go do all right. that crap. And it has nothing yep. to do with a tenant. You know that it's just HUD financing. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we'll mm-hmm. discuss that when we spend more time with these folks. Well, listen, um, if you guys want something free today, first of all, I'm going to say it again. Watch out for the simulcast. It's coming up shortly. Uh, we'll be $99. And frankly, if that bothers you, don't get on the simulcast because the information is going to be on there. It's going to be incredible for you from a real player. Uh, by the way, I didn't ask you, uh, what, 
how much how much what's the value of the, all the properties you will own by the end of this year do you think uh so right now my current portfolio uh, with the properties i'm closing on in about two weeks will be about 260 million dollars wow. uh, by the end of the year i'll probably be north about 325 million somewhere in that ballpark and the debt goes down every month doesn't it every and month the and they put money in my pocket every month uh-huh. yeah and we haven't even talked about that thing called depreciation have we <laughs> wipes out your income taxes, which would be a beautiful humongous. thing. Yes, it is. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Tim. Uh, this guy has got a lot to teach us. And man, what an amazing story. Uh, listen, I'm going to have Tim live at our uh, Great American Real Estate Summer in 2020 in Vegas. It, uh, it is March 31st through uh, April 4th. If you would like some more information on that great event, which will include a lot of absolutely fantastic quality trainers, as well as a lot of cool, fun things that are going on and over $100,000 worth of cash and prizes being given away, and more importantly, a giant deal-a-thon where we actually do deals for students while they arrive. Go to RES2020, that's R-E-S, that's Real Estate Summit 2020, and check it out for yourself and get registered before we uh, raise the price on it, which we're about to do. And I hope to see you there, and I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Tim today. That's all for this edition of the Mentor Podcast. To connect with Ron and learn how you can attain financial freedom, as well as up-to-date strategies to grow and protect your wealth based on today's discussion, go to www.connectwiththementor.com.